Hello and welcome to the HistoryNetwork.org podcast. Season 28, Episode 7, The Battle of Stamford Bridge. This episode was written by Paul Bernardi. By day, Paul works as an IT manager for a major financial institution in the UK and has done so for the best part of 30 years. But in the evenings and weekends, he writes historical fiction novels. His current multi-part series is set against the backdrop of the Norman Conquest, a period which he studied in depth at the University of Leeds back in the 1980s, where he gained a master's degree in Anglo-Saxon history. Keen long-term listeners might recall that this isn't the first outing for Paul with the History Network. He penned episode 4 of season 18, which looked at Operation Foxley, and this was inspired from research for his book To the Devil His Jew, a historical fiction novel following the SOE's attempt to kill Hitler. We'll put links to Paul's books on the website. By the beginning of September 1066, King Harold II was in a quandary. Expecting Duke William of Normandy to invade, he had summoned the feared, what passed for the army in Anglo-Saxon times, made up of a proportion of the freemen of each shire who were required to perform military service in defence of the land. Back in April, and they had long since passed the usual two to three months' service. And now they were starting to grumble. Not only was the food running out, the region around the south coast of England, having been stripped bare to feed several thousand soldiers, but also the men were beginning to look to their own homes. Summer was passing, and with the onset of autumn, thoughts turned to the harvest. If they did not return home in time, crops would wither in the fields, creating a very real risk of famine in the new year. Still, Harold watched and waited, but the long-awaited invasion did not materialise. Perhaps they had survived the year. Perhaps Duke William would not sail now, so late into the campaigning season. The Channel was notoriously dangerous from autumn onwards, when sudden storms could wreak havoc on a fleet of wooden ships. And so it was that, on the 8th of September, Harold gave the order to disband the feared. He returned to London a few days later, hoping that the danger had passed for the year. How he must have felt when news of invasion arrived is a matter of conjecture, but when it did come it was not William landing on the south coast, but rather a fleet of two to three hundred ships landing in Yorkshire under the command of King Harald Sigurdsson of Norway, also known as Hardrada, or Hard Strong Ruler, and his own brother Tosti, who had been exiled from his position as Earl of Northumbria the previous year. Tosti had not taken his punishment well, he had spent much of 1066 raiding the coast of England, whilst also trying to curry favour in Flanders, Scotland and Denmark for his plans for revenge. But it was in Norway that he finally found a willing ally in King Harald. Little is known of Harald's motivation, though, anything from a full-blown invasion for conquest to little more than a raid in the tradition of the great heathen army of the ninth century. Whatever the case, his army of seven to eight thousand men sailed up the Humber into the Ouse and finally landed at a place called Rickal, around ten miles southeast of the northern stronghold of York. On the same day that news of the invasion reached Harold in London, the first significant encounter took place just outside York, near a small settlement known as Fulford. Little is known of the battle, even its exact location is in doubt, but what is certain is that the Vikings scored a resounding victory. The English army, made up of northern levies under the command of the brother Earls Morcar of Northumbria and Edwine of Mercia, were comprehensively defeated, with many cut down or drowned in the ensuing retreat.' 
After the battle, Hardrada and Tosti entered York. That the city was not sacked, combined with the fact that hostages were given to secure loyalty, suggests that the city had opened its gates rather than try to resist. Doubtless the recent crushing defeat played a large part in that decision. Before the Vikings left to return to their ships at Rikal, arrangements were made for a further exchange of additional hostages and supplies on the 25th of September at a crossing on the River Derwent called Stamford Bridge. However, instead of being greeted by the cowed citizens of York, Hardrada and his men, around two-thirds of his total force, the rest having been left to guard the ships, found King Harold of England at the head of a huge army. In the space of no more than a week, Harold had marched north with his Huskals, his household warriors who formed the elite corps of his army, gathering levies from the Midlands, Shires and the North as he went, men who had been summoned by fast-riding messengers who had been dispatched as soon as news of the Viking landing had become known. That Harold caught the Vikings by surprise is sound evidence for his ability as a proven and effective war leader. To achieve such a feat in so little time speaks of a charisma and leadership that is often doubted for what was to happen a mere three weeks later in the south. But there was still a battle to be fought and won. Once again, sources from the time are scant, and much of what we know comes from later chroniclers, which necessarily raises questions as to the extent to which their testimony can be trusted. One thing that does seem to carry weight, however, is the suggestion that the Vikings had turned up wearing little or no armour other than their helmets. The weather was unusually hot, and perhaps in the belief that there would be no trouble, they had decided to leave the heavy mail shirts behind. It would prove to be a fatal error of judgment. Before the two sides joined in combat, however, we are told that there was an exchange between the leaders of the two armies, though the fact that this was reported only by an Icelandic chronicler, Snorri Sturluson, writing over a hundred years later, has to cast doubt over its authenticity. The account states that King Harold of England rode forward with twenty Huskars to offer his brother Tosti peace and the restitution of his earldom, but when Tosti inquired what Harold would offer Hardrada for his efforts, the Saxon king weighed up his adversary, said to be a man much taller than all the others, and stated that he could have seven feet of English soil in which to be buried. The challenge was more than Tosti was prepared to accept, so both sides withdrew to prepare for battle. There is some debate over the disposition of the Viking forces, but it is probable that the main body of men was positioned on the east side of the river, while a sizable detachment was stationed to the west. Some of these men quickly formed a defensive line, to act as a screen to protect the rest as they withdrew across the bridge, but they were soon overwhelmed by the far superior Saxon numbers, causing some foolishly to attempt to swim the fast-flowing river, as the bridge was not wide enough for them all. King Harold was, however, unable to follow up his early advantage. Again, we are indebted to the ever-colourful Snorri Sturluson for the insertion of this story. According to the 12th century chronicler, the Saxons were prevented from crossing the bridge by a lone Viking, a berserker, who held them at bay for some considerable period, slaughtering two to three dozen warriors with great sweeping blows of his two-handed battle-axe. Eventually it took a man of some guile and ingenuity to end this heroic stand. One of King Harold's men, we are not told his name, found a small boat in which to float silently down the river until he was underneath the wooden slats of the bridge. At this point he rather unsportingly thrust his spear point up through the gap and into the Viking's groin. Whilst it is a wonderful scene to be imagined, it is hard to believe that a single man could hold up an army for so long, and so it is hard to give much credence to this tale. Surely the Saxons would have simply launched arrows and spears at him from a distance until he was slain. 
Once across the bridge, the real battle could commence. It took the form of many other battles of the Saxon era, in that the two sides formed solid shield walls and advanced to meet each other, though in this case it was the Saxons who advanced to engage as the Vikings, perhaps fearful of the outcome, had formed a defensive line atop a low ridge to the east of the river. In battles of this nature, it is often the case that there were relatively few casualties between the two shield walls. The men were pressed close together and covered, in the main, by the large round wooden shields, made usually from alder or willow planks covered with a cow's hide stretched fit. These shields were placed in such a way that they overlapped with that of the man's next to you, thereby forming a largely impenetrable wall. With little room to move, the battle becomes a shoving match with the occasional thrust of sword or spear over or in between the shields until one side or another breaks. It is during the rout when most of the deaths occur as the fleeing men have no protection from the pursuing warriors who hack them from behind. At Stamford Bridge it was Harold and the Saxons who carried the day. With so few details available from primary sources, one has to speculate as to the factors that combine to give the English the victory. On paper, it was by no means certain, as the Viking army probably numbered up to 8,000 men under the command of a king whose reputation was feared and respected throughout Christendom at the time. But a few pointers do emerge which help to explain the outcome. Firstly, the Vikings had not been expecting to join battle with the English on that day. Not only had many of them left their heavy armour behind to save themselves from the heat of the sun, King Harald had also chosen to leave around a third of his army back with the ships at Rickau. He did send messengers to some of them to the bridge as soon as he saw the Saxons advancing, but they arrived too late and too exhausted to have any significant impact on the battle. As a consequence, there is every likelihood that the Saxons significantly outnumbered the Vikings, perhaps by up to two to one. Combined with the lack of armour, which left the Vikings more susceptible than usual to blows from edged weapons, this may well have meant that it was only a matter of time until the weight of numbers began to turn the encounter in favour of the English. Perhaps more impactful than either of these points, however, was the fact that Harald Hardrada was slain fairly early on in the battle by an arrow to the throat. It was said that he had attempted to repeat the earlier success at Fulford by personally leading a charge against the Saxon lines, but instead he found himself exposed and isolated and a target for the archers. Perhaps his unusual height counted against him on this occasion. With their iconic leader dead, the morale of the Vikings would have suffered a massive blow. They fought on, nevertheless, unwilling to lose honour by surrendering, even when King Harold paused the battle to offer them quarter. With Tosti also killed, it was only a matter of time until the battle was over. The remnants of the Viking army fled back to the ships at Rickal, where further slaughter ensued. Many were drowned, and some were said to have been burnt in the ships, no doubt as the Saxons set fire to them. Eventually terms were reached, and the survivors were allowed to depart with promises of peace and friendship. It is notable that it is recorded that those that sailed away needed only 24 ships out of the original two to 300 that had brought them to these shores. It was a crushing victory, and one which should have been commemorated down the years in the same way as perhaps Cressy, Agincourt, or Brunnenburg, and, but for what followed a mere 19 days later, at Senlac Hill, it most probably would have been. King Harold can rightly feel aggrieved that his reputation rests more on one battle that he lost than the one he won, shortly before. And this is where the real legacy of Stamford Bridge lies. In the part it played in Harold's defeat at the Battle of Hastings on the 14th of October 1066, but for Stamford Bridge the tussle with Duke William's Normans might have turned out very differently. 
from thinking his kingdom safe for the year in the middle of September, King Harold then had to march around 500 miles and fight two major battles within a month. That he managed to do this of itself is an achievement that should not be underestimated. But without the losses and exhaustion caused by the battle at Stamford, the English army that faced William from the top of the ridge at Senlac would have been larger, fresher and with more of the elite Huskal warriors in the front rank. Those Vikings, the bane of England for almost 300 years since they first raided Lindisfarne in AD 793, have a lot to answer for. Thanks for the script, Paul, and great to see you again. If, like Paul, you'd like to write a script for submission, then drop us a line at info at thehistorynetwork.org. If you'd like to find out the various benefits of becoming a patron, then pop along to patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash the history network for that. And as always, a huge thanks to all our patrons who help make this podcast possible. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to the History Network dot org podcast written by Paul Bernardi, read by Nick Barker. <laughs>